Greetings online students. I am now going to be recording the viral infections in children. Uh, sometimes in the past I've had groups get together and do memory cards and other things and this time I decided I'm just going to record it. There will be times when I say you really, 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 really might want to know this. Know it. That's what I would study. Alright, so let's get started. Let me get me off here. Maybe. Alright, viral infections in children. How exciting. Okay, let's review active versus passive immunity. And I also made a handout and gave you a handout on this that you may want to uh, download and look at as well. Uh, some people do uh, better by picture. So for you people who are uh, visual learners, uh, that may be something that uh, you may want to go by uh, instead of what uh, I have here. All right, so looking at your picture as well that uh, I have put in there for you. In order to determine if someone has active or passive immunity, you need to ask yourself this question. Does my body produce an antibody against the infective organism? If the answer is yes, then it is active. In other words, I came into contact with measles, let's say, okay? And if I came into contact with measles and I actually developed my own antibodies in my body to that, then that was active. If it was given to me, let's say through a um, passive immunity, like through my mother, uh, mother to infant, then that's passive because I didn't develop any antibodies to it. It was passively given to me, okay? I, my body didn't have to do anything except accept it. Whereas with active, I actively uh, develop antibodies. All right, so let's look at active immunity. This is the best method at providing long-term immunity, okay? With this, we have naturally and we have artificially, okay? So that is our choices. Now, naturally, it's by having had the disease. So if you've had measles, you've had mumps, you've had um, anything, uh, scarlet fever, if you've had polio, if you whatever, then you have developed natural immunity, okay? Naturally active, because you naturally come into contact with the disease and your body actively developed antibodies to it. Artificially is when you are introduced through an antigen like a vaccine. So any of your vaccines is artificially, okay? Artificially active. Passive immunity is short-term immunity. Now this would be temporary if it's short-term. So you've got again artificially and naturally. Artificially is if you receive a transfusion of like immune globulin, uh, antitoxins, anything like that, antiserums, if you're getting that from a host, from someone who's already developed antibodies in their blood to it, and you're getting it through a transfusion, then that's artificially passive. The other thing, uh, other way that you can get it is naturally passive, and that's from mother to fetus via the placenta. So again, there will be several questions on your exam over this. So let's test ourselves. Alrighty then. Jane Doe, age five. Uh, has contracted chickenpox from her eight-year-old brother. Which type of immunity would she develop? Okay, let's see, she is actively, her body's actively producing antibodies to it because she came into contact with it and she naturally came into contact with chickenpox. So you should have picked naturally active immunity. Mary Beth, she's a 15 month old who's scheduled for her immunizations today at the Well Baby Clinic. What type of immunity will she develop? Okay, well she's going to be getting her immunizations. So I'm going to actively be uh, developing antibodies. And this time, instead of naturally coming to contact, content with it, it's given through an antigen, through a vaccine. So it's artificially active immunities, which you should have gotten. 
Mark Williams, age 15, was bitten by a poisonous snake. Now he's receiving an antitoxin. What type of immunity would he develop? Remember, any of your antitoxins, antiserums, anything like that is artificially passive because I'm not, I'm just getting a transfusion. Mary Jones delivers a seven pound, four ounce baby girl. What type of develop will baby Jones develop? This one would be naturally passive immunity. Passive because it's given to me through the placenta, but it's naturally occurring. So if you have problems with those, please let me know. Let's look at some common viral uh, illnesses. Uh, let's start out with some good old herpes simplex viruses. Uh, this is one of the most common in humans, and it, even in children we're seeing it more and more, unfortunately. Now, it occurs in two similar strands, type 1 and type 2, or herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2. The bad news is they share the ability to remain in the body indefinitely after initial infection, so that's not good, okay? They will remain latent in neurons of your local sensory ganglia, which is groups of nerve cells that's located in your peripheral nervous system. And unfortunately, then reoccurring, reoccurring symptoms can occur episodically. All right, so let's look at herpes simplex 1, okay? Now, occasionally, herpes simplex type 1 can cause herpes simplex type 2. I'll let you figure that one out. Um, herpes simplex 1 affects mainly the mouth, um, can affect the face, the eyes, the nose, central nervous system, but it lies latent in our trigeminal nerve, uh, which is cranial node number 5. The initial infection may be asymptomatic in children particularly, or it can be what's called acute herpetic gingivostomatitis. Now, what acute herpetic gingivostomatitis is, this, this is an inflammation of the gingival and oral mucosa. And what happens is they end up getting very painful ulcers and fever, as well as very reddened gums. Now, this usually occurs in children under five, and they will have lesions on their mouth and tongue as well. So as you can imagine, oral fluids intake is going to be a big issue if a child gets this. But again, there are some children who are, who are simply asymptomatic. They get nothing on their initial affection. And then some poor children get what's called the acute herpetic gingival stomatitis. Now the fever can get up to 102 to 105. This is a red flag, so we need to watch for febrile seizures. Eating again can be painful. And the reoccurring symptoms later in life come back as usually cold sores or fever blisters. And we know that times of stress, extreme heat, exhaustion, upper respiratory infections can trigger those uh, cold sores and fever blisters to come back. They'll begin as vesicles, they'll rupture, and then form painful ulcers that heal very slowly. You can apply uh, topical anesthetics before eating. Drinking through a straw tends to help and using very soft toothbrushes during that time of inflammation. Now treatment for type 1 is mostly symptomatic because this is a virus. You can give what's called burl solution compresses. These are uh, aluminum acetate uh, bases that's applied during the weeping stages and what those do is help maintain the acidity and provide a protective layer over the skin so that it soothes it and decreases the irritation and the inflammation. Uh, you want to help prevent secondary infections. Uh, acyclovir has uh, been tested in children. It can be given IV, oral, or topical forms. Uh, bland diets decrease the pain. Of course, there have decreased intake, so you want to watch for signs of dehydration and then giving analgesics for pain. Herpes simplex type 2, now we're talking about lesions of the genitalia, primarily an infection of adolescents and adults, even though we are seeing it in younger children. It resides in the sacral ganglia when latent. The initial infection is usually asymptomatic in children with reoccurring symptoms occurring in the genital area. Uh, the initial symptoms are usually itching, vesicles, that rupture become very painful that lasts up to three weeks. Active infection at the time of birth will result in what's called neonatal herpetic infection. 
neonatal herpetic infection occurs about 50% of the time, and about well, half of these infants will die or have brain damage. That's why we know someone has herpes simplex type 2, they get a C-section. Uh, diagnosis is based upon the history and symptoms. Uh, viruses dwell in the nerve cells, so no blood cultures um, for the lesions. The, you can draw antibody titers and perform what's called PCRs, polymers chain reaction test that will test positive for it. And most of the time it's visual. Uh, those who have been in the field long enough, the physicians can actually um, tell by looking that they have herpes simplex type 2. If you've never seen this, I would suggest you do YouTube it so that you can see what it looks like. Treatment, it is contagious. Hand-to-hand, -hand, contact, direct, Treatment is mostly symptomatic, no cure. Uh, again, a cycle of your ointment decreases the time it takes to heal. Um, it decreases the pain, and so you can give this oral for about five to ten days. Uh, Valtrex is the new oral antiviral that's been given. It also uh, decreases the time it takes to heal so that you don't have the ulcer as long. You want to keep it as clean and dry as possible, sits bath, and then analgesics for pain. Uh, type 1 and type 2, here's your typical fever blister you would see, and here's the typical uh, type 2 that you would see uh, on the genitalia. Okay, herpangina. This is not a herpes virus infection, even though it sounds like it. It is a mouth infection caused by the enteral viruses. It's marked by a sudden fever and sore throat, where you get small vesicles on the tonsils, the uvula, and the pharynx, but the mouth and gums are not inflamed. The mouth and gums are not inflamed. If you'll remember with acute herpangina, or herpan acute herpangina stomatitis, um, then they did have uh, the mouth ulcers. Uh, and with the mouth ulcers with acute herpatic gingival stomatitis, they do get on the lips and the gums and the mouth. So that's how you kind of tell the difference between herpangina and herpes uh, simplex 1 acute herpatic gingival stomatitis. You will not see it on um, the gums. Um, it's on the back part. It's on the tonsils, the uvula, and the pharynx with herpangina. This also is painful. It is very self-limited, resolves in about four days. But again, with it being painful, you want to watch fluid intake or dehydration, and it resolves on its own. All right, so what about varicella and herpes zoster, chickenpox, and shingles? Uh, both of these infections are caused by what we know as the varicella zoster virus. Uh, we know that varicella appears to be the primary infection, uh, with shingles or herpes zoster being the reoccurrent. Those of you who have seen the commercial, you know, if you've been exposed to chickenpox, you have the virus living within you, and you do. Herpes zoster does not develop as a result of exposure to someone with chickenpox, but exposure to herpes zoster can result in the development of chickenpox in a non-immune person, okay? Uh, varicella, one of the things I do want to talk about, just, and I didn't mention this earlier, I kind of forgot, um, but be careful about herpes also when we're getting ready, uh, when you're talking about spreading of herpes in children, they have found that it can be spread on towels that people have used, uh, dirty towels that's had weep, you know, that adults have wiped themselves where they were weeping, so that's just a thing to throw in there. All right, varicella uh, versus herpes zoster. We know that varicella or chickenpox is the primary and shingles is the secondary infection. The chickenpox mainly affects children where the shingles is adult and adolescents. This one has usually an upper respiratory infection, symptoms, fever, and abrupt rash where this one's more slow rash and you start actually have pain several days before a rash even appears. And sometimes you can have shingles without the rash full-blown uh, breaking out. Here, with chickenpox, 80 to 90% of those exposed become infected, where the infection rates only 15% from shingles. So people that think shingles is highly contagious, no, but chickenpox is. Uh, with chickenpox, you get the macules that become pacules and the ves vesicles, and they have what we call the dew drop base, red appearance. So it looks kind of like a red raindrop with your vesicle in the, in the middle of it. Where with the shingles, you get the macule papules that vesculate that are found in red patches along nerve root endings. 
Usually the nerve root endings are anywhere like across the breast area, across the lower back area. So they kind of do it in wherever a nerve root, they find that nerve root ending and just kind of follow it. With varicella, you're going to have a bilateral distribution usually on by all sides, heaviest on the trunk and sparse on the extremity with chicken pox. Where with zosters, again, it's limited usually to one or two dermatomes. With the uh, she, with uh, chicken pox, usually you have the vesicles that appear over two to five days. They will end, end up cresting over and healing in about one to three weeks. The disease lasts up to three weeks and longer with shingles. Complications of varicella can be Rye syndrome, which we've learned that's usually because someone has given aspirin with someone who has had a viral illness. So no aspirin for children under 11 ever and pneumonia. With herpes zoster complications, the big thing is what's called PHN, which stands for post-herpetic neuralgia. Now this is excruciating pain that persists long after the viral infection is over. In fact, it can be so debilitating in elderly that it can become a leading cause of suicide uh, and chronic pain sufferers, especially those over 70. There are some medications out there that can help. Um, and there are some uh, newer meds out there with shingles. Uh, we also know that there is also the vaccine that is gaining um, awareness. When it first came out, it was so expensive, no one could afford it. But now more and more insurance companies are starting to pay for it. Um, Thamver is one of your newer anti um viral uh, drugs for shingles. It has the advantage over acyclovir because it's more convenient. Um, more convenient dosing and it hastens the healing of lesions and delays reoccurring. So that's one of the newer, newer uh, meds out there. F-A-M-V-I-R. Alright, so let's talk a little bit. We've been comparing them. Now let's talk about each one separately. When we talk about varicella or chicken pox, this actually chicken pox can cause up to around 100 deaths per year. So when you think that there's, you know, oh, it's just chicken pox. Well, chicken pox does lead to uh, mortality in some children. Varicella zoster, uh, direct contact usually, drop con uh, contaminated objects, and I'm not going to be asking all of this stuff. Uh, incubation periods and things like that. It is about two to three weeks with commonly 14 uh, to 16 days. The period of communability is a probably about a day before eruption to six days after the first crop of vesicles when the crust forms. So when the crust forms, they're no longer contagious. When the crust forms, they're no longer contagious. When the crust forms, they're no longer contagious. Uh, again, the incubation period is about two weeks, and you're going to see that with a lot of viruses. That's a hint. So if anyone says, oh, what's the, what is the uh, incubation period? About two weeks when it comes to viruses, except for a couple. Now, this is airborne and contact isolation through your respiratory passages. In other words, the virus is present in both vascular lesions and the upper respiratory tract of the infected person. So I remember when my aunt made me sleep with my cousin who had chicken pox and I didn't think I would get it only to wake up in the morning and find I had it. I had no idea what airborne meant. So one of the things you want to keep in mind, let's say your house charge and the night, one of the night nurses calls and says, my kid has developed chicken pox. Um, and I, need, I don't think I need to come in since I've been exposed to it. So how would you handle that situation? Okay, the nurse calls, my child has chicken pox, I don't need to come in today because I've been exposed to chicken pox. Well, the first question you should ask is what? Have you ever had chicken pox? Because if she's had chicken pox, guess what? She's immune, she's not a carrier, she's not going to transmit it. So she could still come into work, there would be no problem with that. Okay, now if she's got, if she's immunodepressed or she, her child's very immunosuppressed, um, then, you know, we would want to check in uh, to that and make sure that that's not going to cause any problems. But otherwise, if she's healthy, she should be able to come on in. All right, as far as, um, oops. I think I've been going the wrong way. So 
sorry. Let me get back on track here. Clinical manifestations uh, with varicella. You can varicella, varicella. You can have a slight fever, an anorexia-like uh, state for about 24 hours, and it is highly paretic. In other words, itch, 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 itch. Remember, you have macules to papules to vesicles, and sometimes this can occur so rapidly that you only end up seeing the vesicle because it matures so quickly. But it does have that dewdrop base appearance. Usually, it's bilateral, member heavy on the trunk and sparse on the extremities. Very, very, very um, need to know information. Okay. As far as looking at therapeutic management, uh, specifically, again, acyclovir on the first 24 hours of the rash for varicella pneumonia or mildly immunosuppressed patients. Otherwise, it's just treat the symptoms. So unless they are very sick already and have some immune issues, it's just treat the symptoms. Otherwise, acyclovir, you could give varicella zoster immune globulin if they are a very high risk patient, but it has to be given within 72 hours of exposure. Now, where does this come from? This comes from humans or animal donors that have passive immunity. In other words, it's prepared from the plasma of normal blood donors that have high antibody titers, uh, and it's usually available from the American Red Cross. Okay. Benadryl, antihistamines, and calamine lotions otherwise. Be very careful with calamine lotion, though. You don't want to put that in a lot of open sore areas because then it can be absorbed systemically. Supportive management, then, is just isolation until the vesicles have crusted, usually about a week. Light, where things that are lightweight, loose, and non-irritating because they itch, itch, itch. Keep them out of the sun. You don't want them getting their uh, skin dried out anymore. Daily baths, they can have a vino oatmeal. It's not regular oatmeal, or you'll be calling the plumber. Uh, cut their fingernails short, mittens if they're scratching, remove loose crusts that irritate the skin, and tell them to apply pressure instead of scratching. So they can put pressure down and rub a little, but not scratch, because that causes open scratches on the skin and can cause infantigo on top of what's already going on. Of course, no hot water, perfumes, bubble baths, or anything like that that would irritate the skin. Prevention is Verivax, and we've already been over this. This came out in 1995. You have to be 12 months or older to receive Verivax. We've been over that. Uh, now you have to have two doses. Uh, side effects can be breaking out in a chicken pox-like rash, low-grade fever, and malaise. Okay. Uh, chicken pox and shingles. Here's just an example showing you the difference. You can see here, see the red dewdrop base. This is your chicken pox, and you'll see the vesicles uh, here. For the most part, she's got vesicles with a few macules back in here, but for the most part, this is a good picture. You can see how it is really heavy here on the trunk area and even the upper arm, but on down it was probably sparser. You can get a chicken pox about anywhere. I've seen them in the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, the throat, just about anywhere. And then here is a dermatome where you would get uh, a dermatone on the shingles uh, that's across the breast area in this case. All right, so what really, really, really comes to your mind when I say varicella? I would think no longer contagious when the crust lesions have crusted, about a week. Bilateral, heavy on the trunk and the face, but sparse on the extremities. I would know the supportive care that we talked about. And I would know something about the immunizations. No longer contagious when crust have a crust when the lesions have crusted. It occurs bilaterally, usually on the face and heaviest on the trunk, sparse on extremities. I would know about the supportive care we just talked about in the immunization varivax. I'm not going to talk much about Rice syndrome. We've already been over this, but it's an acute encephalopathy with fatty degenerization of the liver, so it affects the brain and the liver. We know it occurs uh, in children after certain children have certain viral illnesses. The etiology is unclear, but they think it is particularly maybe related to receiving aspirin during that time. And it occurs from neonatal period through adolescence, with the majority occurring in 6 to 11 because people probably thought it was safe to go ahead and give the aspirin by then, and it's not. No aspirin under 11. No aspirin under 11. 
Uh, the prodromial phase, you're going to see malice, cough, rhinorrhea, sore throat. Uh, then you'll have an encephalopic phase where they will appear to be recovering from their bowel illness and all of a sudden have this extreme vomiting. And then seizures, dilated pupils, coma, and then you will get into the staging of Rice syndrome, which occurs in up to five stages. Curse you want to you want to catch it, of course, and you don't want to curse it. You want to catch it in stages one through two and prevent it from going in stages three through five because it does get more debilitating. Uh, diagnosis is made by elevated ammonia levels because the liver's not working well. It's a byproduct of protein metabolism, uh, and then definite diagnosis is made by a liver biopsy. Treatment, again, if you catch it early in stage one, it's mainly supportive. In stages two through five, you're going to have to have more interventions, and they're going to be in an intensive care unit, and you're going to be trying to prevent and reduce cerebral edema. Okay. Uh, nursing considerations is similar to that of a child with increasing their cranial pressure. You're going to be monitoring their pressure, their lab, their vital, strict INO because you're trying to prevent dehydration but also prevent cerebral edema so you're having to really play uh, catch 22 with them. Teaching uh, the parents about hidden salicylates like in Pepto-Bismol, supportive care, and there is a National Rice Syndrome Foundation. Alright, so let's talk about our first one. This is called EI, erythema infectioma. Okay, erythema infectioma. Let me see if I can find this in your book for you. Infectioma is on page 425. It's on figure 14 2. Down at the bottom, you can see that sweet little baby's face. And you can see it looks like she's been slapped a few times on her cheeks, and that's common. The reason this is also called fifth disease is because years ago they were listing all the common childhood infections, and guess where erythema infectioma fell? Number five. Um, the agent is HPV, human papillovirus, B19. Uh, transmission is unknown, possibly respiratory secretions in blood. Incubation period, about two weeks. Period of communability is uncertain. Most outbreaks subside in about a month or two. Now, this mainly affects school-age children, but it can affect adult, adults as well. And if it does affect adults, then it may, they become a lot sicker with these signs and symptoms. Initial uh, symptoms is a low-grade fever, general feelings of malaise. They have a rash that appears in three stages over seven to ten days. The first stage is what we call the slap cheek appearance. Again, that's on uh, page 425 in your book. And this will disappear in about one to four days, followed by a red symmetrical macular papillal rash that will follow. And then a periodic reoccurrence of that rash. If they come into contact with sun, heat, cold, friction, anything can uh, make it come back. Treatment is symptomatic and supportive, and school is allowed because the period of communability seems to be before the onset of symptoms in most children. So by the time you see these slap cheeked and all that, they've already they're not contagious anymore. It's before you see these symptoms. All right. So here's your slap cheek rash appearance. So what really, really, really sticks out in your mind when I say fifth disease, and these are the things that you really, really, really should know for the test. I would think about the three stages of the rash. Know the three stages of the rash. Know that they can attend school because the period of communability is gone once the symptoms have occurred. And that it is highly contagious. Okay. All right, then. Let's get all of our R's going here. Exanthema subentum, which is roseola, which is on page 426 in your book. 426. There's a good picture. Looks like they're having a good old... Uh, allergic reaction, but it's not. It's roseola in this picture. And you don't have to know the uh, agents again, the transmission, incubation periods, and stuff like that with most of these, okay? Unless I say you really, really, really need to know this, okay? All right. 
Um, as far as what causes it, the human herpes virus type 6, it appears mostly in 6 months to 2 years. Rarely do we see it after 3 years old. Uh, incubation, again, they think around 5 to 14 days, so about 2 weeks would still be safe to say. The period of communability is unknown with this one. It is also called 6th disease. Wonder why. Hmm. Clinical manifestation, and I have bolded here, a sudden onset of high fever, 103 to 106, red flag, need to watch for febrile seizures, in a well child or a child with mild cold symptoms is a distinguishing feature. So you'll have a kid that's doing fine, all of a sudden they'll have 104 fever with this rash that's similar to on page 426. The fever falls on the third or fourth day and the rash appears. It appears mainly on the trunk, then the rest of the body, and it fades within 48 hours. It is non-itching. It fades on pressure and very benign in nature. So it's just mainly treatment. Treatment is mainly supportive and Tylenol. So again, it kind of resembles a drug reaction appearance uh, for the most part. Here again is a good picture. You can see it's very heavy on the trunk. So, what really, really, really sticks out in your mind when I say roseola. Sudden onset of high fever in a well child with a rash that appears. First on the trunk, then the rest of the body, and it fades in 24 to 48 hours. I would know that. Very similar to a drug-like reaction. And it's benign in nature and non-paretic or non-itching. All right, let's do another R word. Measles, rubiola, or the red measles, and these are on page 427. This is caused by the rubiola virus, direct contact. It is airborne as well, so I thought I wouldn't get this as well when I slept with my cousin, but I was wrong. Uh, since it is airborne, I woke up and had the measles with her. Incubation period, 10 to 20 days, typically less than two weeks. A period of communability from the from four days before to five days after the rashes appears. So this one has a long period of communability. Uh, it is highly contagious uh, of all of your childhood infections. Uh, again, it's airborne, so um, you have to be on airborne precautions for four days after the onset of the rash. Diagnosis: They can do a viral isolation if it needs to be of your nasal uh, pharyngeal secretions. Uh, the conjunctival blood or urine during your febrile period. But most of the time it's based upon uh, the rash and um, the signs and symptoms. During the prodromial stage, they're going to have fever, cold symptoms, uh, conjunctiva, photophobia, hacky cough, but the big thing is coplic spots. These are small, irregular red spots with tiny bluish white centers. And it shows you a picture of the coplic spots on page 427 in your book. So the first thing you'd want to look is make sure they don't have coplic spots. Now you'll see these opposite the molars particularly at least two days before the rash outbreaks. You'll see coplic spots in the mouth. The acute phase, the rash then begins as the fever begins to peak and it's a very dark red maculopapular rash. What is very unique about the rash is that it begins behind the ears and then spreads head to toe. So a rash that begins behind the ears, head to toe, red measles should be popping in your brain. Now it does last for a while, 10 to 15 days, and then it turns brown. Desquimacites, which means peels off, sloughs off, uh, after about five to six days. So the first day of the rash is a very discreet head to toe manner, and it also gets the palms, and by the third uh, day you are usually, if you look over here, pretty much covered. So look on the first day of the rash, you'll have the complex spots, and the rash will be very discreet. By the third day, you have confluent maculopapulars everywhere, uh, particularly heaviest on uh, the head and the upper trunk. Okay. Complications can occur, otitis media, pneumonia, encephalitis. Uh, treatment is supportive with Tylenol bed rest, um, watching them uh, to make sure that they're breathing okay, encouraging fluids, vitamin A supplements. Some of your recent studies have actually suggested that uh, vitamin A decreases morbidity and mortality and the linkage, we're not sure, but it has occurred. Prevention is the MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella at 12 to 15 months that we talked about. Have to be at least 12 months to get the MMR. Booster, four to six years, 11 to 12 years. 
Susceptible persons who've been exposed can be vaccinated within 72 hours. So if you've been in contact with someone who's got the red measles, it's been within 72 hours, you can receive the MMR. After 72 hours, you cannot receive the MMR. Measles immune globulin is an alternate for those who are very young to get the vaccine below 12 months or who have exceeded the 72 hour period. Never give to pregnant women, of course. These are a good picture again of your coplic spots that you can see uh, before the fever breaks out. I mean, right during the febrile stage before the rash breaks out. So think, think, think what really sticks out in your mind when I say rubiola measles. Coplic spots was my big thing. Coplic spots. What was distinguishing about the rash? It occurred behind the ears, then the face, and then head to toe. It's going to occur, be there for a long time, 10 to 15 days, and know about the MMR. Alright, mumps. Mumps are on page 426 in your book. Uh, mumps can be from direct contact or droplet contact. Incubation period is a little bit longer, 14 to 21 days. This is most contagious right before and after swelling begins. Now you've got the prodromial phase where you've got the headache and malaise and the earache that's particularly aggravated by chewing. Um, then you will have either unilateral or bilateral swelling, pain and tenderness, and then it peaks on the third day and is usually resolved by day 10. Symptomatic and supportive because it is a virus and treat with Tylenol. You do want to uh, get this when you're younger, not when you're older because of the complications. It can cause viral or aseptic meningitis, arthritis, deafness, visual problems, and particularly what's called orchitis epidemitis. And this occurs after puberty when, with about 13% becoming impaired and being sterile. So it can lead to sterility and fertility problems. So prevention is the MMR at 12 to 15 months and it will not help after exposure. Nursing considerations, bed rest, um, analgesics, fluids, bland, fluid, bland foods, hot and dry, com hot or cold compresses to the neck, whichever the patient prefers. If they develop this orchitis, warmth and local support to the scrotal area, isolation during the communicable period, and there's no known uh, particular danger to uh, pregnant women with this one. Here's your good old picture of the mumps. So what really, really, really sticks out into your mind when I say mumps? Swelling of the parotid gland can be unilateral or bilateral. The complications, that it peaks swelling day three and it's gone by day ten. Rubella, um, German measles, all the R's, make sure you get these R's uh, not confused. This one's on page uh, 429. Uh, rubella is um, a big thing uh, as far as pregnant women. The period of communability is about seven days before to five days after the appearance of the rash. Uh, during the prodromial period, this is absent a lot of times in children. Uh, but in the older adult and in adolescence, you may see a runny nose, lymphedemonopathy, anorexia, sore throat, conjunctivus. You're really not going to know what's going on. In the acute phase, though, the rash begins on the face and clears as it moves downward. So it's heavy on the face day one, and then as it goes down, it lasts three days. German measles are the three-day measles. So that's a big clue. By day three, they're gone. Um, and again, they disappear. They start head to toe and they disappear head to toe. And there's a good picture of that on page 429. Um, it is very rare diagnostic wise. We look at nasal secretions. Uh, you can get some complications, but this is really the most benign of all your childhood and adult communicable diseases. Three days and it's gone. The people that are at risk are your pregnant women because it does have uh, effects on the fetus, particularly in the first trimester, resulting in deafness, visual anomalies, heart defects, central nervous system defects, growth, and mental retardations. That's why it's very, very important 
that we see that you've had your MMRs, that we see that you've had your immunizations. And that's why these OB units, when you're doing clinicals there, require that you do that because, uh, because of the exposure to the pregnant woman and the dangers to the fetus. So this is the most important reason for immunizing children against rubella is the prevention of infection among pregnant women or potentially pregnant women. It's the prevention of infection among pregnant women or potentially pregnant women. Okay. Here's a good old picture of rubella. It kind of looks like roseola in a way. It kind of looks has that drug like uh, drug induced uh, like um, look. So what really, really sticks out in your mind when I say rubella? Three days and it's gone. Three days and it's gone. Starts heavy on the face, day one, and gone by day three on the face. So it, as it starts head to toe, it goes head to toe, fades head to toe. Pregnant women and potentially pregnant women are the big culprits we're worried about. Okay. Uh, polio, not going to say much about polio since we don't see polio much, but on pages 428 and 429 talks about polio. Uh, remember the sock and the Sabin vaccines we talked about? Um, remember, uh, we talked about those. Go back and review those. The Sabin, S-A-B-I-N, was the one that was given oral. It can cause vaccine, paralytic polio, and about 10 clients per year. The oral is the live virus, so you can't give it around immunosuppressed family members. Now, the SALK, S-A-L-K, was the uh, inactivated polio vaccine. And it was used for immunosuppressed clients or for infants who have family members who are immunosuppressed. And if you'll remember, the advantage of the SALK, S-A-L-K, was it has no history of causing vaccine-associated paralysis. But the disadvantage was that you have to get injections, sub-Q injections, and it requires boosters for immunity. But I would rather have sub-Q injections and boosters for immunity then get the oral type and end up with the polio. That's all you need to know the difference between SALK and Sabin. Infectious mononucleosis. Uh, it talks about this in your book. Uh, let me see if I can find the page number real quick here. Yes, page uh, 719. Talks about uh, the agent that causes it is the Epstein Barr. Uh, it's not proven, but we think it's direct, intimate contact with oral secretions, also known as the kissing disease a lot. Incubation period is unknown. We know well, the period of communability is unknown. It lasts about two to six weeks. Uh, acute symptoms usually disappear in about seven to ten days, and it can last for months as far as the fatigue. And if you've ever known anyone who's had this, usually they complain of fatigue for months and months. In fact, one of my, my best friends got this right before college started and had to drop out and leave me all alone uh, because she could not get over that fatigue. You do need to know, do you need to know the three clinical cardinal sin signs? Fever that resolves in seven to ten days, a sore throat, and cervical adenopathy. Now, up to 50% also develop splen uh, splenomegaly and hepatomegaly, enlargement of the spleen and the liver. So you may you need, really need to watch these patients. Treatment is mostly supportive. Tylenol, bed rest, gargles, hot drinks, and analgesics. No contact sports because of the hepatomegaly, splenomegaly. Uh, ampicillin is contraindicated. It actually causes a, a rash in most people. Oral penicillin sometimes prescribed if they think they're going if they think they also have strep. And diagnosis is made from a monospot. A monospot is just a spot test where they do a finger puncture and get about five to ten mils of blood, put it on a slide, and see if it uh, clumps with the reactant. If it does, it's positive. Um, you want to again teach about the long-term uh, consequences of fatigue and nail the three cardinal signs. Uh, the kissing disease, so when you grade the tonsils, they're probably going to be a three and four plus, right? And then know the three cardinal signs. Rabies means to rage. This is the last virus we'll talk about, and I believe this is on 955 in your book. And again, the book's not skipping around. I am because it doesn't have a particular chapter just on uh, these things. So page 955, it talks about rabies uh, and it being an acute uh, infection of the nervous system. 
Uh, we know it's transmitted by the saliva of the infected mammal through a bite usually. Uh, it's uncommon in humans, but it does usually occur in children under 15. Uh, usually they're brave in picking at these animals. Only 10 to 15 percent of people bitten actually de can de develop it, but once present, it is fatal. Now, the good thing about this virus is instead of an incubation period about two uh, weeks or so, this one is one to three months, which is a good thing because that allows us time to get immunity on uh, some type of active and passive immunity on board. Okay. The most common domestic animal carriers are... Uh, dogs again. Dogs and cats go back and forth. Now we're back to dogs. And the most common wildlife carriers are uh, skunks, raccoons, foxes, and bats. Skunks, raccoons, foxes, and bats. And those occur in about our those are responsible for about 88% of the cases, the wildlife carriers. The domestic animals are only about 12% of the cases. Okay. Treatment uh, is, let me go back, nope. an, an unprovoked attack, again, is more likely to indicate a rabid animal than a provoked one. Okay. Clinical manifestations that we'll be talking about is the initial stage, the excitement phase, and then severe spasms of the respiratory muscles. There's two types. There's furious rabies and there's paralytic rabies. Furious rabies are the type that we think about when we see Cujo, the foaming of the mouth, and the paralytic is the type that does just that, causes paralysis. Okay. Um, treatment is with the inactivated rabies vaccines. Uh, these induce artificially active immunity, right? Artificially active immunity. And then you can get globulins, which induce artificially passive immunity. Artificial passive immunity. Both types are used concurrently for post-exposure treatment. Once the symptoms appear, treatment is of little value. So because of that long incubation period, one to three months, we want to hurry up and get this active and passive immunity on board. Um, you want to cleanse the wound. Passive immunizations with your globulins and then active immunity with your uh, vaccines, which is your human diploid cell rabies vaccine. Now, these used to be given, uh, these injections in the stomach. We no longer do that. The first dose is given at the same time as your um, rabies uh, immune globulin is given. Um, and it's given also then at day 3, 7, 14, and 28. So day one is given with the same time that you give the uh, globulins, then day three, seven, 14, and 28 days after the first dose. An additional dose is usually given at 90 days just to be on the safe side. You need to know those. You want to provide support and reassurance. The health department needs to be uh, notified of any type of bites by animals. Um, the vaccine, this vaccine is well tolerated in children now compared to the one they used to give, but they still need to be prepared for a series of injections. Um, we do know that the main um, community resources that offer vaccinations would be like physician's office and the health departments. Your health departments do it a lot cheaper, usually at around $5 a visit. Joke of the day, first year, he talks, she listens. Second year, she talks, he listens. Third year, they both talk and the neighbors listen. All right, that's it for this one. If you've got any questions or concerns, let me know.